Welcome to the latest episode in this series of EY videos on the implementation of the new leases standard, IFRS 16, which has become effective this year. The objective of these short videos is to provide helpful reminders during the first year that IFRS 16 is effective, and to share with you some of the latest insights which could affect IFRS reporters. I'm Emily Moll, an Executive Director with the Global IFRS Services Team at EY Global in London. In this episode, we'll discuss some of the agenda decisions reached by the IFRS Interpretations Committee about the application of IFRS 16. I'm joined by Victor Chan. Victor is an International Director at EY Global in London, where he's a member of EY's Global IFRS Services Team and, among others, the Global Leases Subject Matter Group. Victor, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Emily. I'm glad to be here. So before we get into the detail of the agenda decisions, please can you explain what the objectives of the committee are and how the committee issues agenda decisions? Sure. The IASB or the board has suggested that for IFRS to be truly global standards, consistent application and interpretation is required. The committee is the interpretative body of the ISB. It works with the ISB in supporting the application of IFRS standards. Among others, it responds to questions about the application of the standards. In responding to these questions, if the committee doesn't plan to add an item to its work program to draft an interpretation or amend a standard, it issues a tentative agenda decision and requests comments on that matter. The comment period is usually at least 60 days. After considering comments received, the committee will confirm its decision and issue an agenda decision, add an item to its work program, or refer the matter to the IASB. And are the agenda decisions authoritative? The agenda decisions don't have the authority of IVRS standards. However, they are important uh, as they are seen as informative, helpful, and persuasive since they reflect the committee's reading of the mandatory standard. In fact, many regulators require entities to follow the committee's agenda decisions and to the extent that it is necessary, entities need to change their accounting policies accordingly. Thus, entities need to monitor the committee's discussion on various accounting issues and assess how the agenda decisions may affect their financial reporting under IFRS. I think it is also important to emphasize that just because an entity decides to change its accounting policy as a result of the issuance of an agenda decision, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is an error. Currently, there is a project to amend the due process handbook to clarify, among others, the role and status of agenda decisions published by the committee. The comment letter period for the exposure draft closed in July 2019, and the feedback of the exposure draft expected to be available in October 2019. So you mentioned that entities may need to change accounting policies as a result of the issuance of agenda decisions by the committee. So do the agenda decisions have an effective date? There are no effective dates for agenda decisions. When an entity decides to change accounting policies as a result of an agenda decision, the board expects that the entity would be entitled to sufficient time to make that determination and implement any change. How long is sufficient depends on the specific facts and circumstances. As a rule of thumb, it should take months rather than years. That's very helpful. Can we move on now to look at the first agenda decision on the application of IFRS 16? I know it's about the liabilities in relation to a joint operator's interest in a joint operation. Indeed, I think it is fair to say that this is not just an IFRS 16 issue, it is also an IFRS 11 joint arrangements issue. In the fact pattern described in the submission, the joint operation is not structured through a separate vehicle. One of the joint operators, as the sole signatory, enters into a lease contract with a third-party lessor for an item of plant property and equipment that will be operated jointly as part of the joint operations activities. The joint operator that signed the lease contract, often also called the lead operator, has the right to recover a share of the lease costs from the other joint operators in accordance with the contractual arrangement to the joint operation. The question is whether the lead operator should recognize the whole liability related to the lease or the liability based on its share of interest in the joint operation after reimbursement. 
the committee considered paragraph 20b of I verse 11 and observed that identifying the liabilities that a joint operator incurs and those incurred jointly requires the assessment of the terms and conditions in all contractual arrangements that relate to the joint operation, including consideration of the laws pertaining to those agreements. The committee then observed that the liabilities a joint operator recognises include those for which it has primary responsibility. This means the lead operator in the fact pattern recognises the full liability related to the lease and not just the liability based on its share of interest in the joint operation. And what else did the committee say about this issue? The committee highlighted the importance of disclosing information about joint operations that is sufficient for a user of financial statements to understand the activities of the joint operation and the joint operator's interest in that operation. The committee noted that applying paragraph 20A of IVRS 12, disclosure of interests in other entities, a joint operator is required to disclose information that enables users of its financial statements to evaluate the nature, extent, and financial effects of its interests in a joint operation, including the nature and effects of its contractual relationship with the other investors with joint control of that joint operation. So can we move on to the next agenda decision, which is about the customer's right to receive access to the supplier's software hosted on the cloud? Certainly. While only part of the agenda decision is related to leases, I think IFRS reporters can benefit from the analysis of the right to direct use of the underlying asset. The fact pattern describes a software as a service cloud computing arrangement in which the customer contracts to pay a fee in exchange for a right to receive access to the supplier's application software for a specified term. The supplier's software runs on cloud infrastructure managed and controlled by the supplier. The customer accesses the software on an as-needed basis over the internet via a dedicated line. The contract does not convey the customers any right over tangible assets. So it may not be obvious how this is related to leases. Well, one key question is whether the customer receives a software asset at the contract commencement date or a service over the contract term. If it is the former, then it is necessary to consider whether there is a lease. In fact, the committee observed that a customer receives a software asset at the contract commencement date if either the contract contains a software lease or the customer otherwise obtains control of the software at the contract's commencement date. Among other requirements, the application guidance in IFRS 16 specifies that a customer generally has the right to direct the use of an asset by having decision-making rights to change how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period of use. In a contract that contains a lease under IFRS 16, the supplier has given up those decision-making rights and transferred them to the customer at the lease commencement date. It seems that the supplier retains those decision-making rights as the customer only has future access rights. That's right, Emily. The committee observed that a right to receive future access to the supplier's software running on the supplier's cloud infrastructure doesn't in itself give the customer any decision-making rights about how and for what purpose the software will be used. The supplier would have those rights by, for example, deciding when and how to update or refigure the software or deciding on which hardware or infrastructure the software will be run. So the contract doesn't contain a lease if it conveys to the customer only the right to receive access to the supplier's application software over the contract term. Now let's look at the next agenda decision, which is related to subsurface rights. Would you walk us through that? Sure. In the fact pattern, under the contract, a pipeline operator obtains the right to place an oil pipeline in underground space for 20 years in exchange for consideration. The contract specifies the exact location and dimensions of the underground space within which the pipeline will be placed. 
the landowner retains the right to use the surface of the land above the pipeline, but it has no right to access or otherwise change the use of the specified underground space throughout a 20-year period of use. The customer has the right to perform inspection, repairs and maintenance work, including replacing damaged sections of the pipeline when necessary. The question is whether IFRS 16, IS 38, intangible assets or another standard applies in accounting for the contract. So would it be correct to say that if the contract is or contains a lease, the lease should be accounted for under IFRS 16 unless it's out of scope of the standard? That's right, Emily. Um, the committee observed that in the contract described in the submission, none of the scope exceptions in IFRS 16 apply. Specifically, the committee observed that the underground space is tangible and hence the scope exceptions in relation to intangible assets under IFRS 16 are not applicable. The committee considered the requirements in paragraph 9 of IFRS 16 and accordingly, if the contract contains a lease, IFRS 16 applies to that lease. If that contract does not contain a lease, the entity would then consider which other IFRS standard applies. Therefore, the committee concluded that the entity first considers whether the contract contains a lease as defined under IFRS 16. So with this understanding, did the committee then analyse the fact pattern under IFRS 16? Exactly. The agenda decision then discussed whether there is an identified asset in the fact pattern. The committee observed that the specified underground space is physically distinct from the remainder of the land. The contract's specifications include the path, width and depth of the pipeline, thereby defining a physically distinct underground space. Most importantly, the committee observed that the space being underground does not in itself affect whether it is an identified asset. The specified underground space is physically distinct in the same way that a specified area of space on the land's surface would be physically distinct. The landowner does not have the right to substitute the underground space throughout the period of use. Thus, the committee observed that the specified underground space is an identified asset. So the next step then in the leases model is to consider whether the customer has the right to substantially all the economic benefits from use. So what did the committee say about this? Yes, as the customer has exclusive use of the specified underground space throughout the period of use of 20 years, the customer has the right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits from use of the space throughout the period of use. And what did the committee say about the right to direct the use of the specified underground space throughout the period of use? The committee observed that how and for what purpose the specified underground space will be used, that is, to place pipeline with dimensions through which oil will be transported, is predetermined in the contract. The customer has the right to operate the specified underground space by having the right to perform inspection repairs and maintenance work. So it means that the customer has the right to direct the use of the specified underground space throughout the 20-year period of use because the conditions in paragraph B24, B1 exist. Overall, the committee observed that the contract contains a lease as defined in IFRS 16. Thanks, Victor. This agenda decision is very helpful as it provides a comprehensive example on the application of IFRS 16, from scope exceptions to every step of the leases model. And this is relevant in a number of sectors, including extractive industries, power and utilities and telecommunications. I think we've come to the end of the third episode of this series of EY videos on the implementation of IFRS 16. So thank you for watching. I'm Emily Mole and we will bring you more insights on IFRS 16 in our next episodes. Mm -hmm.